Peter, Universal has been a leader in dealing with the, the other industries, the tech industries, the internet industries, uh, people like Apple. The big uh, buzzword today is cloud, that there's this streaming and it's all going to somehow come without anybody owning anything. How is Universal adjusting to that technology to make sure that your artists can get paid, that, that you can get a return on investment? Uh, you know, there's always that balance between encouraging these businesses and not being eaten up by them. Uh, What's, what's the latest thinking at Universal about this whole cloud thing? Uh, and maybe well, explain it a little bit better than I did to the <laughs> audience. Yeah, it, it, ostensibly what Danny's referring to is the ability to store uh, all of your content in a remote location somewhere up in space and then just access it on any device that you want. Uh, you know, uh, for us at Universal, what we're trying to do is, is adhere to the uh, uh, adage of ubiquity. We want our music to be everywhere in as many places as possible. So what we're trying to do is embrace as many of these new innovative technologies that we can. As Danny alluded to, the challenge is, is when you have services that pop up that use your content, use your artist's content without permission, and that's where the gray area comes. And that becomes a little bit difficult because we as a record company, although we're vilified for it, uh, we have a fiduciary responsibility and a moral responsibility to the artists that we deal with on a very human level to not only push their work out there and exploit their work, but to protect their work. And that's something that we take very seriously. Um, you know, uh, everybody knows about piracy. Everybody, I think, here knows the, the pros and cons uh, of the debate. But for us, in terms of new technology, we are trying to do as many deals as possible in the space with as many new services as possible. You know, and, and it's interesting because, you know, you sit in these meetings and you get a real sense of, of how these things are done. And it's not just simply somebody walking in with a new device or a new web-based service and saying, hey, isn't this really cool or a new app? It's, you know, you have to really have a business discussion. Um, when you get beyond the creative or the innovation of it, you need to ask a couple of questions. You know, do do is there a strong management team behind it? And does that management team have experience in this world? And what do they bring to the table? Do they have the kind of right financing behind this, the, the idea? Um, you know, because again, we're giving them access to our artists' work. And, and as, as the folks up here would tell you, and especially Danny, who, who is behind some of the biggest artists of the century, will tell you that there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of sweat, there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into making music on the artist and the creative front. It just is. And that happens on both sides of the coin. It happens on the creative side with the artist, and it happens on the executive side with the record label. You know, these are people who have families who put kids through school and, and on both sides of the coin, and, and they make their living off of what they produce. So I know a bit long answer, but we're embracing as much as possible. Since there are a lot of students here, I know the thing I get asked a lot is, you know, how do you how do you get jobs like ours? How do you get into the business? How do you get somewhere? Um, and of course, we all started in the past, and this is the present, and it's a very rapidly changing playing field. But there are some things still that are similar from decade to decade and generation to generation. I know in my case, I was kind of a mediocre rock writer eking out a living on the margins. And then when I finally got a job as a publicist because I needed to pay my rent, I I just really wanted to be good at something. And I, I made it my business to read every single writer about music. I, I would buy fashion magazines, Mademoiselle and, 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 uh, Penthouse and, and Newsweek and, and, and just, there was no internet then, but I would just get every single thing off the newsstand and memorize the names of the people who wrote about them and just get to know them. So when I finally, a, a couple of years later, was able to meet Led Zeppelin, who was looking for an American publicist, I had something to give them, which was this expertise about something that was mattered to them. And, you know, uh, my book was called Bumping Into Geniuses, and I say, for me, it's knowing and working with great artists that's given me a career, but, but it's not enough to meet them. You've got to have something to offer them. So that was sort of my entry into, into having some professional validity. I'm wondering if each of you could just tell something for the people who want to get into the business about how you feel you turn the corner into professional bi viability and just go starting with, with Maureen. Sure. Um, well, I went to NYU for music business, um, but not really knowing what that meant. <laughs> so, um, you know, your first year there, you're kind of learning a myriad of different things, and one of the courses you take there is 
something called like introductions to the music industry, where it's just like a broad overview of everything, like uh, from labels to publishing to you know entertainment law. Uh, so in my second year there, I decided to you know reach out to you know our listserv that we had and see what kind of internships were out there. And I got an internship with Denise Rich, um, who was a songwriter, and she had a little publishing company, and I was there for about a year. Um, I left to study abroad and I came back and worked as an assistant for her and I just, you know, from just being there, I learned a lot, like, you just learn a lot even from listening to people's phone conversations, like, not that you're eavesdropping, but that's your office environment, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I learned how to pitch songs to other artists, I learned how to coordinate writing sessions there, so, just being there. How do you pitch a song? <laughs> I had one of those jobs. I never could figure out how to do it. How do you do it? Um, you can't be like wildly out of the box. I think like, you know, if you know what the artist is that you're pitching to, you kind of have to like, you know, stay within the genre. But you can come at it from all kinds of angles. Like you can go to the A&R person, but you can go to their manager, you can go to their lawyer. You can just like, however you need to get the song to the artist. Yeah, I... I I had an unusual path, but it was a, my father was in the music business, Capitol Records, a long, long time ago. He just did, like, he took the Beatle records off the ships back then, the big albums, and uh, put them in stores. And he was very, very passionate about music. And I remember him, my writing lessons as a kid at home were writing the lyrics to Beatles songs. And I wrote them all out from song one to the last song the Beatles ever recorded. And I had books, which I still have today. So my, uh, my father got me very involved in music. It was very special to me. Although he wouldn't, he didn't want me to be in a business. He thought I needed to be a business person and get a business background. So he said, "Don't do it. It's too crazy for you." My father's a bit of a crazy dude. So it was. Uh, he said, <laughs> "You need something more stable." So I went to school, St. John's, and and I uh, and I worked. Um, I took a business mi uh, minor in music, and I was. A, I'm a CPA. I was a CPA. I graduated as a CPA and worked at Price Waterhouse. But I, I still loved entertainment and music, so I worked on entertainment clients. Good, good part about that was it got you to learn a business from an outsider looking in. And, you know, you always think you're smarter, but you know you're not. You learn you're not. So you, you look inside a business and you see how, how things are run. And it's, it's a good perspective. And I did that for five or six years. And then I worked in an investment bank uh, where we also had entertainment clients, Warner Music and Universal's mm -hmm. clients. So we did reports on these clients and we learned them. Then I took a company called CD Now Public. And uh, the owner of that was Alan Meltzer, who was uh, the founder of Wind Up Records. And he bought a little, with the proceeds of that sale, he bought a little crappy independent label called Grass Records. And they had some really wacky employees and some really wacky artists. And, uh, and he came, invited me in for lunch, and Creed played that day. Hmm. And we called, he said, would you come in? And, and I consulted for a year to see. I was kind of nervous at the time. I have a, a decent job, and I was nervous of coming into the industry. But I loved it, and I was passionate, and I took a shot. And uh, I came in as a general manager, and... We fired half the company, got rid of 90% of the artists, and renamed it Wind Up Records. And uh, that's where we are today. So my was a background of business that led me to music. Complete accident. <laughs> Complete accident. Um, I had uh, I graduated college, and I was on my way to do a PhD. And that summer, uh, my dad sat me down, and he said, you know, if you're going to have a career... It should be something you love. Don't worry about the money. Don't worry about all that kind of stuff. That stuff follows. you got to love what you do. And it was the best advice I, I, I had uh, gotten in terms of career. Uh, and I thought about what I really loved to do, and I realized it wasn't going to school for another eight years and, and <laughs> being poor. <laughs> so I, uh, a buddy of mine had called me up, and he said, hey, there's an opening at uh, Arista Records where he worked. He was a promotion executive. <laughs> And uh, so I went, and I was an assistant, and I was a gopher. And I wound up being a gopher for Clive Davis at the time. So it was getting his suit. So how did you get his attention? How did I get Clive's attention? Yeah, a lot of people wanted Clive Davis's attention. How did you get it? Uh, <laughs> uh, I went in for the interview and sat down, and he looked at me, and he asked me where I was from. And I said, New York. He said, no, no, where are you really from? I said, I'm from the Bronx. That's where I like, born and bred in the Bronx. And he said, so let's say, for instance, I gave you a cassette 
and because it was about cassettes, I hate to date myself. But if I gave you a cassette, you all know what cassettes are, right? <laughs> <laughs> I gave you a cassette, and you know, I asked you to bring it to this person, and the person didn't want to take it. What would you do? I said, well, I'd probably twist his arm behind his back until he screamed and took it. And he said, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I was like, and for me, it's you know, getting onto what you love. For me, it's I love music. Don't get me wrong. But what I love more is news. I love news. I love making news. I love creating news. I love the strategy behind news. So whether it's uh, politics, whether it's music, whether it's any type of entertainment, I just love news. I'm a news junkie. So that's what keeps me in chips these days. I, I, I have a very quick client story. Can I tell yeah, my, go. Since you mentioned he's anyway, the greatest, but... At the time, Sony distributed on, Sony does domestically. Just, they, maybe, they put say who out. Clive Davis is in case there are people here. Everybody knows who Clive know. Davis is. An yeah. iconic figure and, and one of the greatest a and men of, of uh, a former lawyer. Yeah. Clive's a lawyer. He'd be, and, 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 and at the we wouldn't hold it against him. No. Uh, anyway, if, if we, he had, we had this band Evanescence. We have this band Evanescence. And Clive one day is looking at the charts because our market shares counted through Sony since we go through a major for distribution. So the number one record in the United States was Evanescence. The number one record around the world was Evanescence. So he went to a marketing meeting and he said, well, who the hell is Evanescence? And it's, it's our record. Who's, who's in charge of Evanescence? And everybody room, nobody said anything. He said, well, who's, who's this wind up? And uh, I got a call that afternoon and he said, can you come to my office? I said, sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, so how do I have the number record of the world and I don't even know who the artist is? And, and that's when we explained that we were a distributor label. He wasn't even focused on that. It was just about art, the music, chart mm -hmm. positions, which he loved, yep. which he loves. And, uh, and that was my story. And we had a great three-hour lunch. All the successful people I know have paid tremendous attention to detail. Uh, yeah. you know, they say that Lou Wasserman used to call every day to find out uh, how many people went to the Universal Cities tour until the day he retired. And uh, From his phone call to when I got to the office, he knew that the record started in Little Rock, the six radio yeah. stations that played it, he knew all the four. When yeah. I walked in, I thought I'd tell him how it got started. He knew the answers already. So he's a very well prepared, very smart man. But Danny, that brings up another point too, maybe, is that, you know, when you're trying to, you know, do a trajectory on a career, it's interesting that each of us have kind of had some figure that, not that we, well, I guess we've attached ourselves to in some way, shape, or form. You know, there's been someone who served as, you know, I, Maybe a mentor is on one extreme of the line. Mm -hmm. The other extreme of the line is just somebody that you worked near mm -hmm. and, and was able to call. Um, I learned from so many uh, people um, and, and some successful people. And some people, just like you're saying, working near. I, uh, an early PR job I had was with an old show business firm called Salters and Roskin. And I was the rock and roll guy with long hair. And they had like the circus and movies. And I was kind of a rock snob, the way I guess my son feels about hip hop now. I just felt that that was the real art and everything else was kind of schlock. And there was a woman next to me named Myrna Post, who also from the Bronx, but with a much thicker accent than yours, who did movie people. And she would make all these calls and beg for press. And I, I kind of looked down at her. I thought I was this classy guy dealing with these writers and journalists. But I noticed that, um, I would make a call and then think about what to do next. And she'd make five calls while I was thinking about what to do next. <laughs> and I realized that, that, uh, she was the one who actually knew what she was doing. And that, it, you know, that, 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 uh, it was really one of the great, uh, teachers. Myrna Post. God bless her wherever she is today. <laughs>